Hi, everyone. This is Dan O'Neill, the Executive Director of the Ethan Allen Homestead Museum. Before we get to our third Sunday presentation, I would like to thank the following businesses for sponsoring today's lecture. They made a vital investment in our museum, and their support is why we are able to bring you this lecture series at no charge. This month, we are very excited to bring you Dr. Lindsay Hope Farner, the Executive Director of the Rokeby Museum in Ferrisburg. Lindsay comes to Rokeby after four years at Cumberland County Historical Society in Pennsylvania, where she led initiatives in preservation, heritage, and community engagement with history and the humanities. Lindsay's passion is for the untold stories in history and a clear understanding of the significance of diversity in today's community. Lindsay believes that museums are the places to ask what stories have been told so far and how those stories must include previously silenced voices. All right, thank you everybody um, for joining me to talk a little bit about Rachel Robinson Elmer. Uh, my name is Lindsay Barner, I'm the director at Rokeby Museum. And just to give you a little bit of background, if you haven't visited Berkeley before and you haven't been recently, um, we are located in Harrisburg, just on Route 7. We are a 90-acre site that includes a modern education center, historic homes, historic farm buildings, and uh, two uh, maintained trails, uh, one of which is an interpretive trail that talks a little bit about uh, how the farm um, developed back into a forest in the natural landscape on the site. We are a national landmark uh, site for the second generation Robinson's work uh, as abolitionists in the anti-slavery movement, as well as um, using the site as a stop on the Underground Railroad. And our permanent exhibit, Free and Safe, the Underground Railroad in Vermont, explores the family's uh, abolitionist uh, movement uh, roots, as well as the Underground Railroad within the whole of the state and the ties of the family to some major abolitionists across the United States. So we are open typically May through October, um, but we are open by appointment throughout the winter. So we encourage you to come out and have a look at the uh, site. So before we get to Rachel, who I'm going to be talking about today, I want to go through the four generations who live in Berkeley. Uh, Rokeby um, has had a Robinson on its site since 1796. There have been four generations who have lived on the site, and the first uh, were Thomas and Gemma Robinson, who came from Rhode Island, settled in Vermont, and purchased what we now call Rokeby from the Bacon family. Thomas Robinson was one of the first to bring in Merino sheep to Vermont and became incredibly successful uh, in uh, sheep farming very early in the 19th century. By 1815, they had made enough money that they put an addition onto the farmhouse. So when you drive up to Rokeby Museum, you're greeted with the beautiful frontage of the historic home. And a portion of that front half part of the house was the addition that the Robinsons had put on. The family were Quakers. And when you go through the house, and we're hoping to resume inside tours of the house later on this year, um, you'll see that the house has those beautiful high ceilings, very much from the 17th and 19th century in Victorian homes. Um, but it's also very plain, um, very well done in terms of craftsmanship, but it very much has this uh, reminiscence of um, Quakerism. Our logo comes from the sheep stamp, which I have a photo of here. Um, this kind of double R for Robinson. So this isn't a brand. They didn't brand the sheep but they would have dipped it in ink and then they would have um, dyed the wool so that when they were in the field, they would have known that this was the Robinson. So our logo harkens back to this first generation and the Molino sheep that were brought in uh, in the 19th century. Thomas and Jenna had several children, but the um, two that we explore in our permanent exhibit, Free and Safe, are Rowland and Rachel Robinson. Rowland and Rachel met at school. They married in 1820, and they became um, what we now consider radical abolitionists. They were close with many of the major abolitionists across the country, um, including Lane Garrison, who's the publisher and editor of Liberator, um, Oliver Johnson, who was traveling all across uh, the North, um, helping to coordinate abolitionist movements, working with Garrison. 
Um, and they spent a lot of their time fighting for the immediate abolition of slavery in the United States. And this is where our National Landmarks Addicts comes from. Our collection contains um, numerous newspapers and books and periodicals that focus on the abolitionist movement and the anti-slavery movement. The Robinsons created a lending library to educate other Vermonters on the abolitionist movement. They helped to coordinate the great convention in Ferrisburg, um, where Frederick Douglass came to speak during his engagement speaking tour. And their story is told throughout our site. Um, and one of the amazing things about the exhibit Free and Safe is that we've been able to trace several freedom seekers that they uh, worked with to Rokeby and are able to tell their stories. So when you see, walk through the exhibit, you hear the story of enslavement and abolition through the eyes of Simon and Jesse, who are two freedom seekers, the Robinsons, um, uh, brought to Rokeby and stayed at Rokeby for a period of time before moving on. Rowland and Rachel had three children, and um, one of the most well-known of those three children is um, Rowland Evans Robinson and his wife, Anna, who lived at Rokeby. Um, Rowland is well known for his literature. He became a very well-known author, both within Vermont, but also across the United States in the 19th century. He was uh, writing about Vermont life. He uh, wrote about, uh, he wrote novels, he wrote about history. And in many ways, we would consider Rowland an ethnographer today. He was a conservationist, a naturalist. He was interested in history and culture and language. And all of these were incorporated into his books. He started out his life as an illustrator and he did cartoons and commentaries um, for periodicals such as um, uh, Forest and Stream, uh, which is now Field and Stream today, uh, 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 lots of hunting and shooting magazines. And he eventually started to lose his eyesight and with the help of his wife, he began to write. And many of his books were um, dictated with his wife helping to write them and her communicating back and forth with the publishers. But it's really his legacy that um, really created what becomes Rokeby Museum. His children decide that they want to memorialize his contribution to uh, Vermont literature and culture. And they begin to gather a lot of his drawings, writings, and it becomes the beginnings of what uh, Brokeby Museum is eventually founded on. Their children, um, this fourth generation, are really the ones who are cataloging this legacy and beginning to look towards the future of what becomes the museum. The youngest daughter, Mary, who's at the top, um, was a uh, uh, talented in art. Um, she took after her mother, Anna, was incredibly talented, particularly when it came to her naturalist drawings. And Mary very much took after her. And she started to make a career out of um, publishing uh, botanical uh, paintings, often for uh, identification books. The eldest daughter is Rachel, who I'm going to talk about today, who became a commercial illustrator in New York City. And then the middle child was um, Rowland, who married Elizabeth Monaway Robinson, and they stayed at Rokeby. They, they navigated this kind of shift in agriculture in Vermont as you start to see a decline in population, a decline in agriculture. You see um, Rowley and Elizabeth really moving Rokeby into this next stage, and diversifying dairy, um, working more within the orchard and even opening the home to tourists as the tourism industry really starts to take off in the 20th century. And they navigate the war period, and eventually in 1961, um, after Elizabeth passes away, the museum is handed, or the house is handed over to the museum in order to really preserve this legacy of the family. The one incredible thing about the Robinsons is you can call them pack rats, um, but they saved everything um, from each generation. We can trace pieces within our collection going the whole way back to Thomas and Gemma. And we're still working to piece together a lot of the items in our collection. 
We have an incredible partnership with Middlebury College where our letters um, that belong to the family are on permanent loan, which makes them uh, easily accessible for researchers to go through. They're slowly being digitized and put online. But we have 15,000 letters in this collection that tell the history of agriculture and abolition and slavery movement and the story of each of family members and the work that they were doing through all of the generations. So the Robinson I wanna talk about today is Rachel Robinson Elmer. So Rachel is the uh, theme or her topic of our uh, 2021 seasonal exhibit called A Modern Artist, the Commercial Art of Rachel Robinson Elmer. And we decided to look at Rachel's art um, for a number of reasons. First, last year during 2020, we had an artist in residence. And I put that in quotes because Courtney never actually came down to Rokeby. She did her, all of her work from Montreal. Um, like so many things, the pandemic kind of threw things up in the air. But Courtney had visited Rokeby before and she absolutely fell in love with Rachel's art. We have boxes and boxes of Rachel's artwork in our collection. And during a visit to the museum, she had the opportunity to look through some of these pieces and absolutely fell in love with the work that um, she had done from her um, postcards to commercial arts to her paintings. Um, she wanted to explore her life a little bit further. So through a series of blog posts that were, oh, that were offered virtually for free throughout the summer, um, she explored Rachel's correspondence course that she took as part of her early education. And the, we were able to piece together so many parts of Rachel's life and pieces of artwork that had never been on display before that we really wanted to take it to the next step and create an exhibit that looked at just how beautiful and uh, multifaceted Rachel's artwork uh, is. So we thought this would be a really good opportunity to build off a very successful program from 2020 where people had to encounter Rachel virtually to where they could come and see her artwork in person. And then the second reason was, is I had started in September and I really wanted to get to know the Robinsons. And I thought, what better way to get to know our collection, to really dig into a topic and to really start to understand members of the Robinson family than to have an exhibit that I have to go in and research a family member and just spend all winter really getting to know Rachel and falling in love with her artwork and with her um, writing, with her letters to her mother and to her sister. And this was a great opportunity for me to start to get to know the family, especially somebody coming from outside of Vermont and knowing the history of the family, but not knowing them closely. As a historian, I really enjoy getting to know family members um, closely um, through their writings and by researching them. So this was a great opportunity for me as well. So Rachel was really um, introduced to art from a very young age. Um, I had mentioned earlier her parents, um, Morella Evans Robinson and Anna Stevens Robinson, and both of them were equally talented and artistic. Uh, Rowland started out as an artist. Um, Anna was an artist doing a lot of mechanical works, many of which we have in our collection. Um, and they introduced her and encouraged her to engage in art from a very young age. And one of my favorite pieces that we have in the collection is a series of picture books. And I have one here from 1880, uh, which is Little Rachel's picture book um, from Mother. And this book is just, it, it's so Robinson in many ways. Um, it is recycled clothing. Um, there's a brown outside color, cover that looks very similar to some of the clothing we have in the collection that was cut up. Um, it's linen pages that have been hand sewed together. So this reuse of items that the Robinsons were saving. And then pasted onto the linen pages are um, ink, pen and ink drawings that were clipped from newspapers, and magazines, and their um, pictures of bunnies, as you see here, of horses, of landscapes, and people. And you start to see this um, kind of late 19th century illustration history in these little picture books that Rachel starts to copy through her education. And this 
Um, the drawing that we have on the left-hand side of Anna Stevens Robinson is an early sketch that Rachel did of her mother that is very reminiscent of the illustrations that were being published and were clipped into her little picture book. So we start to see um, the, the influence of her parents starting to creep into her education as well. And along with this, Rachel begins to um, show this talent and her father creates a little uh, sketchbook for her. She's um, showing talent as an artist. And so in 1891, her parents enroll her in a correspondence art course um, with known art critic Ernest Knopf. And she begins to um, send drawings back and forth between Knopf um, and he will essentially give her an assignment. She would do it. She would mail it to him. He would give uh, feedback and then mail it back to Rachel with the next assignment. And she does this for a number of years, from 1891 to 95. Um, she's corresponding with Knopf and taking this art course. And one of the really cool things that we were able to do last year as part of Courtney's Artist in Residence to start to pair up pieces in our collection with some of the letters that we have with Hillary College. And our education intern and um, Courtney were working closely together and they found this incredible sketch that Rachel had done for the course with not writing his corrections in it. And just looking at the sketch, the corrections make no sense whatsoever. There's a block with some lettering on it and you can kind of guess that he was kind of playing with this like shades and depth. Um, but when you pair it together with the letter from October 4th, 1892, you can really get an understanding of what Knopf was trying to teach Rachel. And the really interesting thing is Courtney notes in her blog post that this style of teaching is very similar to um, ways that she was being taught that are being taught today in art school um, and ways of kind of showing you know, how to bring out the best um, in an artist. So we have this incredible letter that we've been able to pair with this um, early sketch as Rachel was just learning her craft. And Knopf saw a, a lot of potential in Rachel's artwork, so much so that he invited her to New York City to his studio in order to train with him for a summer to help further um, her career. And he felt that she would get a lot more out of meeting with him in person for an intensive course than just communicating back and forth by a mail. So Rachel and her mother go to New York City for a summer and she studies quite intensively with Knopf uh, to really hone in some of her skills prior to going off to um, Goddard. Um, so soon after um, she finishes with Knopf in 95, she goes off to Goddard College um, and she continues to study art, she's teaching a little bit when she's at Goddard, uh, teaching art courses, um, and she eventually starts to, to work um, commercially, but it takes her a number of years. Knopf is really encouraging her to send her illustrations in to publishers, and she's a little hesitant, um, but she does start to work with her father, and he, at this point in the late 1890s, um, Rowland is almost completely blind, he's lost his eyesight, but he's still writing, but he can't do his illustrations any longer. So we find Rachel starting to do some illustrations for her father for his books. And um, one of them um, is Sam Lovell's Pants. And you can see we have her sketch in the collection for what becomes the cover of the book, um, as well as the sketch of her father that uh, can be found in a lot of the, as the, the inside cover page. Um, it's uh, reused and republished in a number of Rowland's books. And so Rachel's early career is very heavily influenced by her parents and their encouragement of her art. And so she goes on to Goddard, um, and in 1899, she goes to the Art Students League in New York City. And this, again, is another um, incredible opportunity for us to um, piece together portions of our collection as we've been going through Rachel's uh, uh, life and trying to put this timeline of her artwork together. And I think that this uh, collection, this piece that we have in the exhibit is 
uh, just really just a great example of just how serendipitous everything has been from Courtney's work and piecing together letters and artwork um, to uh, myself and my colleagues working in the collection to start to uh, research Rachel. We've been able just to piece together so many of these different artworks from this beautiful plaster cast um, to the drawing of that plaster cast as part of her education. And one of my favorite things that we found this uh, winter, I was going through the collection. I found a folder of letters in the archive that were marked undated to Rowland Evans Robinson, RER. And it, the first letter in the folder was on Art Student League letterhead. And it was very clearly from Rachel to her father. And it's very likely, even though this is an undated letter, that it was 1899 uh, because uh, Rowland dies in 1900 and Rachel is back in Ferrisburg for most of uh, his illness. So it's very likely an 1899 uh, letter. And she's writing to her father about what she's seen in New York, meeting all of these wonderful artists, working with very famous artists, Cox at the Art Students League. And she notes that during her live drawing class, um, she, after they do their drawings, they hang them up on the walls and the teacher goes around and writes their um, thoughts on the drawings um, for them to take back before the next class. And she writes that on one of the, the live drawing uh, sketches that she did, that Mr. Cox gave me the same criticism as last time, to fat and round and wobbly. I know what to work for now, strength and simplicity. So I read this letter in the morning and I thought, wow, what a, a beautiful quote into kind of her educational experience. And later that afternoon, I was going through the art boxes, finding some pieces for this exhibit and opening the very first box halfway through the items that were inside. I find this large sketch of uh, a woman from the live drawing class in the very corner of the sketch, it says soft, round, and wobbly. And I immediately went back to that letter that I had read earlier that morning and was able to piece together this kind of criticism that Cox was giving her to a sketch that we have in our collection. So, so many of these pieces have just started to come together as we've been doing this research. And we really start to get an idea of Rachel as she was growing as an artist um, going into the 20th century. So one of the things that Rachel is most known for are her set of postcards, uh, her first set of postcards in particular that she published with the Fallen Company. Our very first seasonal exhibit that we held at Rope was a celebration of the 100 years uh, anniversary of the publishing of these postcards. Um, they were beautiful illustrations of scenes of New York. And there's this fantastic quote from 1915 in the New York Tribune that says, recently some interesting cards have been made by Rachel Robinson Elmer. She has gone about the city and sketched some of the beautiful things that she has seen. And there are these absolute gorgeous postcards that show scenes of New York that are almost unlike anything that you would typically see as you were walking through New York, but instantly recognizable. Um, anything from you know, the light tower to parks, the cityscapes, it's, they're just beautiful um, pieces of artwork that are highly collectible today. And Rachel became very well known for these postcards. Um, the period that she did this is known as the golden age of postcards. And um, she really gets um, called out throughout her career for this set of postcards. But she did these kind of in the middle of her commercial career. Um, in 1915, she's already published a number of books. She's done illustrations for children's books, uh, a number of advertisements. So there's a whole portion of her career that in many ways uh, is kind of overshadowed by these beautiful postcards that she did as well. So what we really wanted to highlight in our season of exhibit was all of the other commercial artwork that she was doing, that these postcards are a beautiful part of her uh, work, but she also had a lot of other gorgeous illustrations. And one of the really neat things that we can trace in our collection is from the postcards to the illustrations is we can trace her entire process. And so we have here uh, 
from 1903 in the Youth Companion, there was a little story called Like a Soda with Little. And Rachel did the uh, little illustrations that accompanied this story in the Youth Companion. And Rachel published a couple of um, illustrations in the Youth Companion quite regularly. But we have these beautiful sketches on 11 by 17 paper of Priscilla. And then we have the final print copy that um, was published uh, December 24th, 1903. And what's really neat about the collection with Rachel is we can trace every single part of her process, which is not something a lot of museums can say with their artwork. From her initial sketches, all the way to the um, playing around with the costuming to the final print publication, we have all of this in the collection. So one of my absolute favorite pieces um, is from A Princess Finds a Pyramid by Caroline Hoffman um, in 1918. And it, within Rachel's sketchbooks, we can see her thinking through this particular illustration in the book. Um, we can see her playing around with the tunic and the cape and the hat and the colors that the soldier are, is going to be wearing. Um, is he holding a sword? Is he going to be holding a, a rifle with a bayonet? Um, she plays around with all of this in these sketchbooks. And then we can look at the final illustration and see what she decided to do in the end. Um, and that's one of the most incredible things with with Rachel's work is that she's not playing necessarily from historical accuracy, but she's looking at the beauty and the movement of the costumes of people. And she's really using these costumes and how she's designing them as a way to distinguish herself as an illustrator. And at the end of her life, um, Fayette Barnum, who worked with Rachel and knew Rachel, notes that in more imaginative works, there was this gaiety, a lightness of touch and humor that made grown-ups as well as children delight in the fairy elves. And in particular, she's talking about um, A Pilgrim's Progress and her illustrations um, for the adaptation of that book. And one of the things that you see within illustrations within the 20th century is that many of the illustrations style-wise are very similar. Um, so you have this illustration from the Pilgrim's Progress, and it's, it's very similar to other illustrations that you're going to see published in books all across the publishing industry in the country, early this country. Um, but illustrators were able to put a mark on those illustrations through the costume. And one of the things that Rachel did was play around with those costumes so that it distinguished her from all of the other illustrators that are out there. And looking back on her life, a lot of her colleagues in the publishing industry noted just how imaginative she was. And you do get this sense of whimsy when you look at a lot of Rachel's work um, because she was taking a lot of time and thinking through this costuming as a way of distinguishing herself. And we see within Rachel's work that not just distinguishing herself in terms of costuming for a lot of the children's books she was doing, but then also with some of the advertisements that she had, she had a style that you start to see over and over again. So from her advertisements for the General Federation of Women's Club to an advertisement for MetLife Company, you see the reuse of some of these themes, um, very much harkening back to her first postcard series. But as she starts to go through um, her career and after the publishing of those first postcards, you see this kind of change from almost a picturesque type of illustration from the 1915 postcards to 1916, 1917, 1918, you really start to see her illustrations taking on her own style. And you have these gorgeous views of say New York City, like in the uh, General Federation of Women's Clubs, where it's this, kind of abstract sketch that is very distinguishable as the skyline in New York City. Um, and she starts to see within like the public, the um, top card where they're raising funds for replanting in France after World War I, where you have this kind of whimsy of the illustrations that she did for children's books mirrored with many of the advertisements that she was doing 
and the style of illustration that she's starting to develop for herself. And then we find that Rachel decides to do a second set of postcards. And this second set of postcards is completely her own. With the first set, she is working um, with a publishing company, with um, Pia Fallen, who publishes those postcards. And she decides with her second set of postcards two years later that she is going to do these all on her own. So she um, prints them herself. She creates the linoleum blocks to um, publish them. She's cutting them herself. She is um, marketing them herself. So in many ways, we look at these postcards as quintessential of Rachel. They are Rachel. There's very little outside input coming into these postcards. They are her style. They are her vision. They are her view of New York City. And we can trace each postcard from her initial sketch on the stiff board to the final publication. She even printed the posters herself and the wrappings of the postcards herself. Um, all of these were done um, by her, um, a lot of it done at Roku. And what's amazing is you can see this complete shift from that first set of postcards where some of them are very much like a painting. Uh, to this kind of new, more um, 20th century, almost art deco type of um, sketching through these postcards, uh, just absolutely gorgeous and bright and colorful and views of the city that you wouldn't typically think to see it. So one of the things that we ask in the exhibit and that we're constantly asking about Rachel that um, when Courtney and I were kind of talking through this exhibit, um, you know, what if, what if Rachel had lived past 1919? Very tragically, Rachel becomes one of hundreds of thousands of people to die during the flu pandemic in New York City, uh, well, across the U.S., but she was in New York City at the time. Um, and she was kind of building up to the height of her career. And her uncle um, does an issue with the Vermonter in 1919, reflecting on Rachel's life and asking for feedback from publishers and colleagues in the field. And many of them lament hearing of her death because they were excited to continue working with her because her illustrations were becoming known within the um, publishing world. And uh, Dr. Griffiths, who was the author for Dutch Fairy Tales, which was one of the last publications that Rachel did, um, she did these gorgeous illustrations in the Dutch Fairy Tales that really start to hearken to this new illustrative style that she is starting to uh, move into. And he was hoping to work with her for his next set of Belgian fairy tales. Um, and, and upon hearing of um, her death, said, found to my disappointment and sincere grief that she had passed away. And so we can't help but wonder where would have Rachel's career gone? If you do a Google search or do a search of any kind, and, uh, you don't see Rachel's name come up very frequently if you search 20th century illustrators. Um, in fact, you don't see a lot of women come up. But as we were doing research on Rachel and illustrations, there's a lot of female illustrators in the 20th century. And Rachel's name doesn't come up even as a illustrator. Um, her postcards are well known, but her illustrations have largely been forgotten. And in some of the books that she published in, she's not even listed as an illustrator. We only know because her name shows up in um, some of the illustrations after they were published. So we can't help but wonder what if. Um, and the, the exhibit really explores this, um, this question, and we ask people to kind of leave with their own answer. Um, and we give examples throughout the exhibit of these just absolutely imaginative and beautiful pieces of artwork. Another thing that we explore and that we've been kind of talking through is what is the difference between um, commercial artwork and fine artwork. And in many ways, Rachel's first set of postcards are fine pieces of art. They are considered um, beautiful depictions uh, uh, of New York City. And uh, Courtney Clinton, that was one of the things she wanted to continue to explore after her artist in residency program was completed. 
and starting to look at this idea of um, commercial art also being fine art and where those lines start to blur. And that is one of the things that she's going to be talking about later on this summer. Um, and looking at this, this um, kind of melding of lines between Rachel's education in fine arts and her commercial artwork, and just how we can consider much of her um, publications and her illustrations very much part of this fine art tradition. So we invite you to come to visit this exhibit, to look at Rachel's artwork, and to really explore and come to your own conclusions of um, you know, what if, what if Rachel had lived past 1919, um, and also just enjoy the, the beauty and whimsy of these um, gorgeous illustrations done by Rachel Robbins. So if you'd like to visit Rugby Museum, we're open seven days a week, May through October, 10 a.m. to 5 p.m. And in between, we are open by appointment, um, November through March. And we hope to see you at the museum. And thank you so much. Thank you, Dr. Varner, for a wonderful presentation. Next month, we are really excited to welcome Robert Grandchamp for his talk entitled Sketching Burgoyne's Campaign, the story of the Von German watercolors. The talk will focus on a series of paintings done by British and German soldiers in the 1777 Saratoga campaign, specifically those done by a German captain. These watercolors can only be seen as copies in the United States. The reason you cannot see the originals is because they were destroyed by Allied bombings during the Second World War. We hope to see you next month. And as always, if you enjoyed this presentation and would like to support the Ethan Allen Homestead, please go to the donation link in the description box below or on our website, ethanallenhomestead.org. Thank you very much and we'll see you next month.